Hello, Lieutenant General Rainey here. Thanks again for sharing some time with me. What I'm going to talk about today is the profession. Uh, I thought about the first topic to spend time with you all on, and my thought process was, what's the one thing, if I had one time to talk to the CGSC class, what would it be about? And I chose a profession for several reasons. It underpins everything we do. But the main reason I picked that first for CGSC is if I only had one terminal learning objective for your entire year here, is that when you leave this summer, you're fully bought in, you understand the profession, you're a card-carrying certified member with the character, competence, and commitment you need to spend however much longer you're a member of our great army, living up to the fact that we are a profession. So let me start with some references today. The, there's the classics, Huntington, hopefully you've read that. Always keep a copy of that on my desk everywhere I go. Uh, Morris Janowitz is another uh, I would put in the classic uh, expected reading category. We've got some good Army doctrine on this topic. You're all well familiar, ADP 622. Very well written, kind of macro level expl explanation of what we're talking about. A couple other things I'd recommend to you. Uh, former Chairman and Chief of Staff of the Army, General Dempsey, uh, wrote a white paper back in 2010, The Profession of Arms. I think it's as succinct an expl explanation of the profession as I've personally come across. There's some experts, contemporary. Uh, Don Snyder, retired uh, out of the U.S. Army War College. I, I would commend you to read anything that he has ever written, but particularly about the profession. Uh, Tony Pfaff is another expert. I recently read uh, Nate Finney and Ty Mayfield's edited book about the profession that I found very interesting as a kind of a primer to the profession well done piece of work so let's start with what a profession is and you kind of intuitively know that but there's uh, several definitions out there it's kind of like the definition of leadership i think we all have to kind of work through that and think about it and be able to define it what it means to us but uh, they're historically if you're a, a purist which I kind of am in that camp, there, there aren't a lot of professions. Um, medical, legal, the clergy, and, and I would offer and argue that, that the uh, professional military falls into that, that very small category of true professions. So professions have a body of knowledge that they are experts. Expert knowledge, number one. The, their public or, or the citizens provide them with privileges based on the assumption that they are in fact expert experts so expert knowledge gets you privileges that are not afforded to other people in your society in your country that's also underpinned by the expectation that a profession is self-regulating that we police up ourselves and take care of and uh kind of the gatekeepers of getting into the profession are the profession itself. And then most importantly to me is that all that is so that we can do good on behalf of the citizenry, so we can do public good. So that's kind of the baseline that I'm coming at you from when I talk about what I mean by a profession. Expert knowledge, public privilege, self-regulating, all to do good for our great country and our citizens. Another big debatable position or thing that people think differently about is, is in the U.S. Army is who's a member of the profession and when. Is it everybody that's in the Army? Are there people that are contributing to the profession but not full members of the profession? Are they are there people at different points in their career that are aspirational, so they're not quite full members of the profession, but they are aspiring to that? Second lieutenants, maybe, as an example. 
um, have to abide by the value systems and the ethic of the profession, but lack the experience to be referred to as experts. That's something you need to think about. Huntington would argue that NCOs are not part of that. I personally, that may or may not have been true at the time he wrote his book, but I think that's something that you should examine and come up with an opinion on. Um, we have uh, the world's best non-commissioned officer corps. I think I could make an argument based on education experience that, uh, that we clearly include non-commissioned officers at some point in their career as full members of the profession. But I, I don't want to want to spend time today arguing about that. But you ought to understand what you're, you ought to be able to define a definition. You ought to be able to define the profession, what it means to you. And you ought to have an, a, a position that's well thought out about who's a member of it and when. Indisputably, majors transition to field grade officer post MEL4 CGSC, you are indisputably a full card carrying member of the profession of arms in the United States Army. I, I, I could win that argument with anybody. Um, and that's why it's so important that we, we talk about this for a little bit. And that's why I think CGSC, that's why I'm so passionate about CGSC. 90% of the officers in U.S. Army, CGSC's last stop of your professional military education. Unless you're fortunate enough to command a battalion and do that successfully enough to be selected to go to the War College, which is about 10% of the, of the majors will end up in the War College, maybe a little bit more. So uh, once you understand what the profession is and who's a member when, there's some things you ought to add to your kit bag. Uh, the first is you have a we have a professional responsibility. That's one of the things that professions have. Going back to our responsibilities to our <clears throat> civilian leadership, civilian control of the military, um, you have a responsibility to the citizens, and you have a responsibility to the men and women you lead and you serve with. So you need to think about what that is. I, I would offer one for you or a definition for you. I think our professional responsibility in the U.S. Army is to win wars, not fight. We gotta be great at fighting. I'll talk about that in a second. But you don't get credit for fighting. We have a responsibility to win wars, and not just win, but to win them in a way that's sustainable, and to win them in a way that's worthy of the incredible cost in human life and treasure to achieve that victory. So that's my first thing I'd like you to take away. I, I offer the professional responsibility we have is to win wars in a way that's sustainable and is worthy of the incredible cost to achieve that victory. After our responsibility, I think we have a professional competence that we should hold ourselves to and aspire to. I think that is the ethical application of violence. So I think the competence that I'm looking for, that I think we should all aspire to as members of the profession, is that we should be able to ethically manage violence. If you think about it, one of the things that's unique only to our profession is that we are given the authority and trust by our leadership to take human life. And that's not something that you should let pass by lightly in your thinking. We're also, a professional military that's values based. We don't do the things that some of our enemies do because we're a values based military. We fight according to the law of armed conflict always. We hold ourselves accountable and punish those who don't. So I want you to think about that. Are you competent are you competent at the ethical management of violence? And I'm coming to you as a former infantry officer and a, a maneuverist, a combined arms uh, leader, but that applies to everybody across every field. Uh, you, you either apply violence or you contribute to the application of that violence to achieve strategic objectives. And you should understand how you fit into that and make sure that you are competent in doing that ethically. Again, that's what makes our military 
different and better than the people we fight. Next, after our responsibility and our competence, I believe that we have a requirement to be experts. An expert is a high bar. Um, it takes time uh, in our profession. But there's two things that I think to be a full member of our profession that we should hold ourselves to expert level of standards at. The first one is leadership. The second one is war fighting. So as you work towards being a value-added, card-carrying member of our profession, those are two things that are on you. Develop expertise as a leader and as a warfighter. Leading not just yourself and your formation, but developing other leaders that work for you. And warfighting, whatever that means based on your branch, your functional area, your specialty, however you contribute to our mission, that's your war fight and you have a responsibility to be an expert at it. So I'll end up with, so what? So, so why does it matter? Why is this the first thing that, uh, that I'm talking to you about? Why, uh, why in the midst of the current COVID fight that we got going on, uh, am I figuring out how to use social media so I can tell you what I wanna tell you about the profession? And really there's three, three reasons that us being a profession being able to articulate that and defending that, right? Defending our profession. There's three reasons, uh, and they're all kind of trust related. Okay, so first of all, people. Um, we're an all volunteer force, as you know, and we expect the population of the United States to join us. And if we are not viewed as a profession, and this turns into a job that you some people can do, we are not gonna attract the talent, the dedication, the commitment, those great men and women that we've all served with that have signed up on their own to be part of that one or two percent that serve. That is underpinned by the fact that this isn't a job, that this is a profession. Second is civilian control. Okay, uh, I'm sure we've talked about this a lot, and you know that, that that's a fundamental tenet of how our military operates here in the United States, that, that we are under control of civilian leadership. So the trust and confidence of our civilian leadership up through the DOD chain of command and in Congress is underpinned by the fact that we are a profession. The amount of money that we are provided the authority and responsibility that we're provided by our civilian leadership depends on us being a profession. So when we have major lapses in discipline, misconduct, um, I personally think the current fight against sexual assault might be the biggest threat to our profession, our inability to get that under control and protect our soldiers from each other. Uh, and that's, that's why that's not just some mandatory training. That's something that I'm incredibly passionate about, and I know you are also. But uh, the fact that we're a profession and maintaining the trust of our civilian leadership demands that we act and behave like a profession and protect that at all costs. And finally, um, us, internal. Um, the things that we expect of each other and, and the things we have to do to be effective leaders and commanders in the Army are hard. Uh, it takes a lot of work. It takes sacrifice. Uh, we put our families through incredible amounts of stress and turmoil, move our kids around, spend time away from our family. That idea of selfless service, that what we do is bigger than us and more important you wouldn't do that for a job we do that because we're members of a profession and that's how important it is so I'd ask you to think about that the, the people that we serve and protect the civilians that have authority over us and control us and 
our teammates and ourselves and the selfless service and commitment it requires to provide the kind of leadership that the men and women we lead deserve all demand and require us to be effective members of a profession, of the profession. It is what makes us different and what makes us the best army in the world. So thank you very much for sharing some time with me. I look forward to discussing this further. Uh, please email me, call me until we can get back uh, into physical contact. We'll stay in electronic, digital, social conduct. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you.